Robin Hansen. Uh, so Robin is a really interesting individual. I'm actually in the middle of reading uh, a book he co-wrote called The Elephant in the Brain. Uh, there's another book he wrote, which is on my list. It's The Age of M, uh, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth. But what we're here to talk about today is prediction markets. So if we think about all the challenges that we have faced uh, in having discourse about uh, things that might happen in the near future uh, and so forth, uh, it, it's very clear that we're not very good at predicting the future and that we can be better. And so who better to speak to than uh, one of the pioneers in prediction markets, Robin Hanson. Welcome. It's great to be here, Greg. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, so yeah, could you tell me, could you tell me a little bit about, you know, first, first of all, you're, you have a really interesting background, uh, you know, you, uh, working in physics, working in artificial intelligence, uh, and now an economics professor. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, kind of what drives you, like what, what drives you forward every day and every week? Uh, you have some really interesting theories on how we can deal with the coronavirus and stuff, which we're not going to talk about today, but. Uh, but I would love to know kind of like what drives you on a daily and weekly basis. Well, I'm, I'm more of what they might call a polymath or generalist. Okay. I think most people would be that if they could as intellectuals, but the professional environment kind of forces you to specialize in order to succeed. And I sort of slipped by barely uh, not specializing as much as I should have. Nice. Uh, but I basically get to look around and ask what's the most important, interesting question and then focus on it. So. I did too much of that before I got secure, but now that I have tenure, I can do it as much as I want. Uh, and one of the most important questions is, how do we decide, how do we together decide what to believe about most everything, but including policy choices? Nice. Uh, and so can you tell us, so, so you, uh, you were part of uh, kind of uh, promoting the idea of developing pine, uh, or prediction markets. Can you tell, Give, give us a sense of what a prediction market is and how uh, it might be helpful. So um, all, all through our lives, including most of the previous talks I just listened to, we have to make choices about what to believe. We have to decide how to believe. And epistemology is the name given for this question of how to decide what to believe. But most practical epistemology is social epistemology. How do we together decide what to believe? How do we come together into a shared institution? And an obvious way to test the difference between institutions is just to look at head-to-head -head horse races. Two institutions predict the same thing at the same time, who's right? So in the horse races we've seen so far, we consistently see one institution winning. When there's in the same topic at the same time with similar resources and you're looking at institutions that have to be robust and general, then speculative markets or betting markets have just consistently just won these contests either they're about as good or substantially more accurate than the other. So that suggests that we try to use betting markets a lot more to decide together what to believe. Okay, so a betting market is essentially, uh, it's a, let's say it's a technology platform of some sort where people can come on, uh, come on and they can, uh, they can propose a future uh, situation such as coronavirus is gonna spread around the world and different experts can then bet on the potential outcome that they're going to be, it's going to spread to a million people, it's going to spread to 500,000 people, uh, and the, the right. person... So, for yeah. example, right now, uh, we're worried about whether we can let up lockdown and how much we could let up lockdown. So we could be betting on how bad this is going to get and then bet conditional on whether we let up on lockdown now, say, or May 1st, or whether we wait till June 1st or something like that. We can ask for different decisions, what does the market expect the outcome to be, uh, an outcome that we care about, and that's what I call a decision market. And that's, mm. or I've given the name futarchy to that when used in a governance mode. And the idea is that we could inform our key decisions by letting market speculators tell us what they think will happen conditional on key choices we might make. Okay. So these are so so essentially it sounds like what it's doing is it's taking it's giving incentive for people to come together and focus on a particular question and uh, an incentive for people to get it right. So if you have an expert who is currently working in some bureaucracy at a government, uh, they might be better off spending their time on this uh, 
you know, trying to make predictions about the future because they can essentially uh, they can they can bet on it and they can make money from it and they're right. Yeah. So, so there's all these people out there who know different amounts of stuff, but unfortunately, a lot of them pretend to know more than they do. If you would only listen to them more, mm -hmm. and we have to decide who to believe and how. So we can't just go with what people say that they know. But we can't just go with credentials prestige because there's a lot of people who have a lot of credentials who don't know very much about a key topic. And there's a lot of people who know a lot who don't happen to have credentials or prestige. So we need a way for people to self-select and say, I do know more, but then suffer the consequences if they're wrong and the rewards if they're right. And that's what a betting market does. So if we have a betting market on say, the, how bad COVID gets, if we locked, you know, lock, release lockdown on May 1st versus June 1st, then even if they have some personal business interest in the decision, uh, when they're betting, their mainly incentive is to get, get it right, to make the correct prediction so that they will win their bet. Interesting. Uh, uh, so, so and, and in theory, it can make us much smarter about all the decisions that we make on, on every level in government and so forth. What? Absolutely. Yeah. So most of our institutions that you're part of say that they are trying hard to collect expert information in order to make informed decisions to help us all. Your businesses, your churches, your governments, mm -hmm. uh, your clubs, they're all saying that that's what they're doing. And they do that to some extent. But honestly, most people know that most organizations, high level actions and, and interactions and what people say is dominated by politics. People are savvy about saying what they think people wanna hear, saying what the dominant dogma is, agreeing with their powers that be. People are so eager to say what people want to hear and to say what will make them look good that they don't pay as much attention as we'd like to getting it right, to being accurate. And so the question is, how can we create an institution that these people would participate in and be as selfish and ambitious as they might always be, but mm -hmm. channel that ambition into get, giving us accurate answers to things? Okay. And so do you, so, so if we look at our world now, this, you know, governments and uh, companies and so forth have heavily, heavily politicized. Can you see a path forward just for, for example, in government in order to, to the point where government is working on systems like this, where they can make predictions kind of in a transparent manner and really kind of have a conversation with the populace that really makes sense. Cause right now nothing makes sense. None of these conversations right. make sense. So the hard thing is not to figure out how to make the world better. Unfortunately, the hard thing is to figure out how to make anyone care about making the world better. Mm. That is, uh, we have these institutions that seem very promising and we could adopt them and plausibly make ourselves better. But what we really need, I think is the best, the most likely path is to do trials, to do demonstration projects. where at a small scale in a limited domain we apply this method there and get a track record of success or failure with a consistent track record of success in small uh, personal applications or small organizations, then we can entice people to try larger and larger applications based on seeing the other success and being wanting to copy that success. So in fact, even though I think this has great promise for national or even international governments, I'm not proposing to do that now. What I really would like people to do is to get their church or their business or their small organization to try this for their key decisions, mm. collect some data about that, show us, compare doing it the usual way to doing it this way, collect a track record showing that this works better. Just like we already have the track record that prediction markets in general seem to work mm. better, but we need to show that for the purpose of advising decisions, yeah. this works better. And that can inspire people to copy. So I like to think of this as like cost accounting. Mm. Today, we have the practice of doing cost accounting. That is, we watch for people stealing the money and seeing where the money goes and where the resources go. Imagine a world where nobody did cost accounting. In that world, if you said, hey, I think we should do cost accounting in some mm -hmm. organization, you would basically be saying, somebody around here might be stealing. Let's find out. Now, mm -hmm. that would not be a very welcome message. Mm -hmm. You would be pushing uphill to try to get that adopted. Now, imagine a world where, like ours where everybody does cost accounting on most big projects, and you say, hey, let's not do cost accounting in this project. Mm. Could we just do that, please? People would interpret that as saying, you're yeah. going to want to steal and you'd rather us look away. And no, we're not going to yeah. do that. The same concept can apply for these prediction markets or these decision markets. In a world where nobody's doing them, if you suggest doing them, you're basically saying, 
somebody's bullshitting around here. We need to cut through that and find out what's really going on. It's not actually a welcome message in most organizations. Yeah. You're kind of insulting people. In a world where for every project, say you have had a deadline, you just had a prediction market on that deadline. If somebody said, could we just skip the prediction market on the deadline this time, please? Would that be okay? Well, then of course, the problem would be people would be thinking they're saying, we're going to miss yeah. the deadline and could we just not look at that? So okay. I have hope that if this became the usual thing, then uh, people would be pressured into doing it just because it would look bad not to do it. So even though people aren't doing it now and it's very hard to get it started, just like with cost accounting, if it was the usual thing, I think it could stay. Okay. Uh, and just, just one last question, then we have to wrap up. But um, what is the current legal status of prediction markets? I know, I know there were some problems because technically it's betting and people put it in the same category as like betting on cards or horses and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So, so if you want to do a prediction market with you and strangers participate, then the betting market obstacle will be substantial. But if you have an organization with, say, employees or members, and the organization can sponsor people to participate, then there are not legal barriers in terms of betting. That is, the betting law requires three things. You put consideration in, you get consideration out, and there's chance in between. Uh, if the organization sponsors participants, then they never put anything in, and so the, it's not gambling. Okay. So in fact, most organizations can do this legally. They are put off because it's politically disruptive. Basically, as I say, most organizations are dominated by politics, and uh, these prediction markets are, are out of control. It's like having an autist, someone on the spectrum, be in the C-suite, someone who's really smart and really knowledgeable, but doesn't know whether what they say is politically acceptable or mm. conflicting with some dogma. That person would not last very long in the C-suite because they might become an assistant to someone else, but they would not be allowed to sit at the main meeting and just say whatever came to their head. Got it. And that's what prediction markets do. They are disruptive because of that, okay. which is why people are reluctant to adopt them. But if you could get your organization to just try it, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to help. Then we could start to create a track record of showing that this works and then shame or inspire others into copying. Awesome. Well, I'd love to at some point get on the get on a call with you to discuss how we can ri raise the profile in prediction markets and make us all better at uh, predicting the future. Uh, but thanks so much for jumping on the call today. Really appreciate it. This is such an interesting thing. I'm really enjoying your book, The Elephant in the Brain. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I like your mind. It's amazing. Great to meet you, Greg. Great to meet you as well.